Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. On Wednesday, we've been uh, doing a series. This would be part two of that series on our forever home. So this evening, I want to talk a little bit of, about uh, the uh, preparation for the eternal kingdom. Uh, the Word doesn't give a whole lot of detail. Uh, doesn't really give a mass of detail concerning the eternal kingdom. Uh, between the, the period that's between the termination of the earthly kingdom, uh, the theocratic kingdom, and the union of that kingdom with the eternal kingdom of God. Uh, the uh, eternal state, you might call it. Uh, I guess it is called uh, uh, the eternal state. Certain uh, momentous events uh, transpire uh, so that uh, every vestige of rebellion uh, will be obliterated and God will reign supreme. And uh, I doubt, I seriously doubt that that's going to happen in one day. Uh, there's a purging of the eternal kingdom. Uh, there are three events that are predicted in the scripture that m might be viewed as, as acts of purging the universe of the remnants of the curse uh, so that the eternal kingdom may be fully realized. Uh, the release of Satan uh, the, and the satanically led uh, revolt, the purging of the earth by fire, and the judgment on sinners at the great white throne. Judgment. It's one of those topics that I'm not very comfortable talking about, but we're going to touch on that. Now John, uh, through the Holy Spirit, uh, being the author, uh, John de depicts a scene on uh, the earth at the termination of the millennial age, the or that when the thousand years ends, that really staggers the imagination. If we go over to Revelation chapter 20, we read, and, and he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil, and Satan, and bound him a thousand years, and cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more, till the thousand years should be fulfilled, and after that he must be loosed a little season. And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the, are in the four corners of the earth to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. That is Revelation chapter 20. Uh, and so, it has been the uh, interpretation of amillennialists from Augustine to the present day that the little season uh, there in Revelation 23, 20 verse 3, refers to the present age. Uh, according to that view, uh, Satan uh, was bound during the earthly ministry of Christ. Uh, but was to be released at the end of this age. You know, to many, the little season has, has been an extended period, uh, perhaps even the entire age. However, Revelation 20 reveals that the binding of Satan does not take place until after the second advent of Christ, and that he continues bound until the termination of that thousand years. The little season... Uh, in which Satan is loosed is, is after the thousand year reign is completed prior to the eternal state. Revelation chapter 20, uh, when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. Uh, that sets the time of this release uh, clearly. Now the purpose for which Satan is released is, uh, is readily discerned from his activity at the time of his loosing. He goes forth to deceive the nations in order to lead a final revolt against the theocracy of God. There is, there is yet one more attempt on the part of Satan to reach the goal of his first sin. 
The release of Satan is viewed in Scripture as the final test that demonstrates the corruption of the human heart. God has subjected fallen humanity to numerous tests in the development of His program of, of uh, the kingdom and of a redemption, and man has failed under every test. And people tell me today, I, I'm... I'm under law, not grace. Dearly beloved man has been tried and tested under every possible condition in every possible way. Uh, he's been tried under goodness, uh, government, law, grace, and now he's being tested under glory. The purpose for which Satan was released then was to demonstrate that even when tested under the reign of the king and the revelation of his holiness, man is an utter failure. And yet people try to convince me, persuade me to believe that we are under law as a principle of life. While those going into the millennium were saved, they were not perfected. Their children, they're going to procreate during that period, that thousand year reign. There'll be many generations come and go. People will live and die. Their children will be born with the same fallen sin nature that their parents were born with. There will be the elect children of God during that thousand year period, just as there has been the elect children of God in every dispensation. It won't be any different. Now, while Jesus Christ rules with a rod of iron, outward conformity to his law will be necessary. The binding of Satan, the removal of external sources of temptation, the fullness of knowledge, the tremendous provision from the king cause many, will cause many whose hearts had not been regenerated to give this required uh, conformity to the law of the king. But man will be tested and proved to be a failure. Dearly beloved, as in every age in which God has dealt with mankind, human nature will not change during this thousand years, apart from God's sovereign grace. Is the carnal mind at last friendship friendly with God? Is there a friendship with God? You know, have a have a a thousand years of absolute power and absolute benevolence, both in unchecked activity done away, has it done away with all war forever? Has it? Will it? No. These questions must be marked by a practical test. That test proving failure apart from God's grace. Not a test to, pr to prove something to be good. Well, God, I'm going to, God says it like, as if God says, I'm going to I'm going to take man through this thousand year period and I'm going to test him and, and hopefully, man, he'll come out to be good. There are two types of testing. One is to prove something that is, that is, is, is good, is genuine. And then there's another Greek word that's used for testing something to prove that it's not. And in this case, the test is to prove that man is a failure. That test, proving failure apart from God's grace. It's always been about grace, folks. It always will be about grace. So let him, let him run. Let, let Satan loose. Let him loose from his prison. Let him range once more. You know, ride the range once more. You know, across earth's, uh, all the earth's fields that he knew of old, you know. He, the last time he saw them, they were soaked with blood and flooded with tears. The evidence 
and the uh, accompaniments of his own reign, he sees him. He sees him now laughing with abundance when he's loosed. But the person in that period, that thousand, it's, and it has always fascinated me, that thousand year reign period has always fascinated me. Uh, it's just, it's hard to comprehend actually being born in that age. And imagine, you know, there's not, there's not different governments, you know, uh, 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 as, as we know it today. It's a theocracy. You're born into a theocracy and so are your children. But as you, that person in that period, as you, you move further, further away from, from Jerusalem, from the center of this blessedness, Jesus Christ becomes fainter until in, in, the, some, in some far off corner, you know, of the earth, that affection, it just ceases altogether. And you'll, you, that person, you would find uh, multitudes of others who have instinctively shrunk from close contact with God and that holy city, and you are now a people that are once again ready to be deceived. Satan will go about deceiving the nations. So even the sovereignty of our Lord Jesus Christ over the earth does not change the heart of man. A righteous reign together with all the blessings that are associated with it and the full enjoyment of a world redeemed from the curse is not sufficient to make man other than what he is naturally. And the testing and the proving of this is accomplished by the loosing of Satan after the thousand years are finished. It's all been designed, constructed by God before time ever began. Now, a thousand years, certainly, you know, in prison won't bring moral change in the nature of this evil spirit. He comes up out of his dungeon with his heart filled with the fires of hate whose, whose flames kindle a revolution among the nations of the earth to try to overthrow our Lord Jesus Christ. Kind of hard to wrap your mind around, but that's what's going to happen. Among those unregenerated in that day will come the multitude known, known as Gog and Magog, uh, who come up against the camp of the saints, uh, which must be Palestine and the beloved city, you know, which must be Jerusalem. And this rebellion cannot be identified with that invasion of Gog and Magog that's described in Ezekiel 38 and 39, but it does bear the same name in that the purpose is identical. In these two satanically motivated movements, which is to destroy Christ's rule. And God designed all of it. So it's in this manner that God removes all unbelief from the theocratic kingdom in, in, in anticipation of its merger with the eternal kingdom of God. And so now this brings us up to the purging of creation. Because of Adam's sin in the garden, a curse was placed upon the earth by God, as he said, cursed is the ground for thy sake. So it's got to be purged. <coughs> in sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life, thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, Genesis chapter 3. So it becomes necessary to remove the last vestige of this curse from the earth before the manifestation of the eternal kingdom. Peter describes that event. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness, looking for and hasting, hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. Second Peter chapter 3.
Note that Peter does not say that the day of the Lord commences with the dissolution of the present earth, but that within the day of the Lord, this dissolution will take place. His word is, the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Second, second Peter chapter 3. The text further states, but the heavens and the earth which are now by the same word are kept in store, reserved unto judgment and perdition of ungodly men. So the Holy Spirit relates the dissolution of the present heaven and earth to the time of the judgment and the sentencing, the carrying out of that sentence on the ungodly, which we know from Revelation chapter 20 takes place at the great white throne judgment after the millennium. So the purging is the act of God at the end of the millennial age after the final revolt against his authority in which the earth, the scene of rebellion, is judged because of its curse. And then there's the judgment on sinners. Before the great white throne appear all of the dead, that's Revelation chapter 20, those resurrected unto life have all been called out of the grave a thousand years before. Those resurrected here are to be judged to, to be appointed unto the second death, that is eternal separation from the kingdom of God. God's purpose in the judgments at the end of the millennium is to remove from the eternal kingdom all things that offend and them which do iniquity. By this judgment, God's absolute sovereignty, the sovereignty that I try to so steadfastly preach, has now been fully manifested and realized. The destiny of the lost is not a comfortable topic. First of all, it's a place in the lake of fire. We know that from uh, many passages in uh, Revelation. It's described as everlasting fire in Matthew. It's described by Mark as unquenchable fire, uh, emphasizing the eternal character of of the retribution of the lost. The lake of, of fire is a place, not just a state or a, a state of mind, although a, a state is involved. Just as heaven is a place and not a mere state of mind, in like manner, those reprobated go to a place, um, and I believe immediately upon death, immediately, because they slept through all of that time up, up until the time of the great white throne judgment. They slept. You don't know anything when you're sleeping. The dead know nothing. That's a verse. You can go look it up. They sleep, and they're awakened at the end of the thousand years. All of that time to them was eclipsed. They had no realization, no recollection of it. That's, that's why that we immediately go into God's presence as saints when we die, and the lost immediately go to their place of punishment when they die. Because, you know, but we tend to mix and confuse time and eternity. And this is a complex subject, but I've done several videos on this, but we're not... That's not the purpose of this video here. Uh, that it is a condition of unspeakable misery is indicated by the figurative terms that are used to describe its sufferings. Mark talks about it as everlasting, uh, or Matthew talks about it as everlasting fire. Uh, Mark uh, says, where the, their worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. Uh, Revelation the, uh, says the lake which burns with fire and brimstone. Uh, it also, uh, we see in Revelation, it's called the bottomless pit, uh, outer darkness, a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth, says Matthew. Uh, fire unquenchable, says Luke. A furnace of fire, says Matthew. Uh, blackness of darkness, says Jude. 
and their, there's the smoke of their torment ascends up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night. That's Revelation chapter 14. Now, folks, it, it would be a feeble attempt on my part, since it's beyond the power of words to describe, to actually expound on all that. But I want you to know that nearly every one of these expressions fell from the lips of Christ. You know, in the, well, I guess you could say in the, even in the verses in which he didn't, he still did. It still came from him because he's the word. But he alone has disclosed almost everything that we know that's revealed of this place. It's, it's, it's almost as if no human author could be depended upon to speak forth all of this terrible truth. You know, in Matthew 25, we read, you know, where the Lord says to the wicked, depart from me, ye cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. You know, the word prepared there literally is, is having been prepared, suggesting that the lake of fire is already in existence and awaiting its occupants. And such a place as a lake of fire, I'm, note I say a lake of fire, not the lake of fire, but such a place is known to science today. The word lake has to, uh, you know, it must connote a body of matter having liquid form. Therefore, if scripture is true, which I believe it is, then this eternal fire must be in liquid form. You know, the very simple proof of the portions of scripture we've been discussing lies in the existence of midget stars, uh, white dwarf stars, a midget star uh, being one which, because of some things which have happened to it, not quite clear at this time, uh, should be roughly 5,000 or more times as big as it really is. You know, applying this idea for illustration to such a planet as the Earth, you, you must conceive the Earth as having shrunk to such a, uh, an extent that its diameter would be about 400 miles instead of being 8,000 miles in diameter, as it actually is. This enormous density has a great deal to, to, to do with our subject. You know, most people know that the sun, our nearest star, is pretty hot. You know, there's a general agreement that the temperature at or near the center of stars is between something like 25 million and 30 million degrees Fahrenheit. And at, at those temperatures, a lot of things can happen, like the bursting of atoms, which helps to explain the phenomenon of the white dwarf. A temperature of 30 million degrees Fahrenheit could explode atoms. It'd cause atoms to lose their electrons, even though the attraction between nucleus and electrons is an octillion times the attraction of gravity. The separated parts could then be better packed in, particularly under great pressure, with the constant activity of x-rays, atom walls could not be formed, could not reform, uh, therefore uh, enormous densities such as are found in the midgets can be attained. Now please note at such high temperatures all matter would be in the form of gas, in a white dwarf, the pressure is so great that gases become compressed to the consistency of a liquid, although they may still respond to the characteristics of a gas. Before such a star could cool off and gradually become dark, it would have to expand to normal proportions. That is, it would have to get to be more than 5,000 times its present size. Such expansion would cause enormous heat, which in turn would absolutely keep the star compressed so that insofar as astronomers and physicists know, the midget stars can never cool off. The white dwarf, to all intents, can never burn out. The Bible, folks, God's Word, is scientifically accurate. We find first an eternal fire which can't burn out, being of a liquid consistency. Uh, it's a lake of fire. Uh, 
It can't be quenched because any quenching material like water would just immediately have its atoms stripped of electrons and be packed in with the rest. Since uh, astronomers have been and still are studying this uh, strange phenomenon, it's only too evident that the lake of fire has been prepared and it's now ready. Although we cannot say that God will actually use these lakes of fire in fulfilling his word, the answer to the skeptic is in the heavens where there are lakes of fire. The resurrection of the unsaved, the body of the unsaved evidently will be of such a, a character that it's indestructible even in the midst of such a lake of fire. And next week, we'll be looking at the creation of the new heaven and new earth, a topic which I find much more, much, much more exciting than the topic that I just discussed. Thank you for joining us. I love you all. I truly do. Until next, join us Sunday for our study in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Until then, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.